Alright, brother. So this is gonna be part two of the video. Now I just wanted to go some over certain articles to just you know bring out a further understanding of uh, what it means to quote unquote be purified or clean in the eyes of the most high. So this article is titled Ancient Jews and Cleanliness. The conception of personal cleanliness as both a prerequisite of holiness and an aid to physical fitness is central to the Jewish tradition. Cleansing with water for physical as well as spiritual purity was commanded in the Old Testament. Moses bathed Aaron and his sons before their ordination, or, ordination as priests, Leviticus 8 and 6, of course, because in the ancient world, both fire and water were um, used as ways to purify people. That's why, for example, if you were used to the time of the flood, the Most High destroyed the earth through water. That was a way to purify the earth. And we know when Christ makes his return, like it says in Second Peter, I believe the third chapter, the earth is going to be purified by fire, because that's 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 the way to clean it. First, he used water. Now he's going to use fire. But continuing on, clothing contaminated by mold or mildew had to be washed. A diseased, unclean person had to quarantine outside the camp until the infection ceased. When the disease was gone, the person had to wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and bathe with water. Diarrhea, a urethral discharges meant disease, uncleanness, and the ill person as well, as all those around him had to wash their clothes and bathe in fresh running water semen and menstrual blood were unclean and required water cleansing the seemingly tedious list of leviticus of clean and unclean that required water cleansing were in reality prescient medical um, methods are preventing the spread of infectious disease as well as practical pra practices that reinforce the need to be clean outside to cl be clean outside was a metaphor for inward spiritual purity plus there were certain clean and unclean animal and insects that could not be eaten meaning the reason why our forefathers were doing uh, certain things, you know, out outwardly is was to represent something inwardly. And that's the thing with the Bible. Every time you see something that's uh, represented outwardly, it always has a deeper spiritual meaning, meaning something that's supposed to be happening within your mind. If you're just doing the outward appearance and you're focused on the outward appearance of a uh, quote unquote saving you, then you truly don't have an understanding of what's supposed to be going on internally. Continuing on, the Jews were of all ancient peoples the most aware of how sinful, how unclean they were before their power and how much they needed to be cleansed for them for their sins. Your iniquities have separated you from your power. Your sins have hidden you, his face from you. Your hands have sta are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt. Your lips have spoken lies and your tongue mutters wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads his case with integrity. They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin a spitter's. Spiders nest, their feet rushing the sin, their thoughts are evil thoughts. Ruin and destruction mark their paths. Our offenses are many in the most high sight, and we acknowledge our iniquities. That's Isaiah 59, 2, uh, verse 5, 7, and 12. Continue on. The strongest example in the Old Testament of spiritual cleansing is the annual release of the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And again, that scapegoat, if you read in the... Um, in the Hebrew, the words the word for scapegoat is azazel, <laughs> which um, you know, in, in this society is um, one of the uh, names for quote unquote uh, uh, Satan or the devil or or the goat. That's why uh, in this society, for those of you who've seen the image of the Baphomet, met you know the, the the demon with the goat head, it lets you know they that, that that they essentially they worship the concept of sin and wickedness. Continue on. Let me read. When Aaron had finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forth the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it, it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert. Then Aaron is to go into the tent of the meeting. And take off the linen garments he put on before he entered the most holy place and is to leave them here. He shall bathe himself with water in the holy place and put on his regular garments. Again, he had to cleanse himself with water. Because in the ancient world, water was very important when it came to cleansing. It was ritualistic. But again, brothers have to understand we're not in the ancient world. <laughs> but let me continue on. The scapegoat carrying in its body the collective sin of the Israelites is typically one who bears all the blame for something he did not do. The Yom Kippur scapegoat let loose to die in the barren desert was released year after year. Sin could be put away for a time, but it was not eliminated. 
after officiating at the sin slash atonement ceremonies, the high priest would have to bathe himself with water in a holy place to cleanse himself physically from the spiritual filth of sin. <laughs> and again, I just want to steal a joke from one of my good friends, Ken. He'd always mention for people who uh, quote unquote get water baptized, it's like, what water are you using? Because <laughs> ain't no holy water today. It's, it's dirty water. It's dirty water. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? But uh, let me move on. By the time of Christ, ceremonial cleanliness by water had become institutionalized into a purity ritual involving full immersion in the mekev or mekwet or a collection of water, meaning that was a, a ritual tradition that was important for the people during that time period. It was not something that was meant to be done for perpetuity. Because again, truly being baptized is something that's spiritual, not uh, physical, but when we uh, go to the aspect of our forefathers who did immerse themselves in water, they weren't immersing themselves in water because that's how they they needed to do that to be saved. They were immersing themselves in water as a representation of what was going on internally. Basically, it was a, a, it was a way to show others that them being dipped in this water physically is what was going on in their spirit. But them being dipped in the water was not it was saving them. It was their, their change of their heart and their spirit that was saving them. Continuing on. Mikhaev purification was required of all Jews before they could enter the temple or participate in major festivals. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims converged on Jerusalem for Passover and the other major feasts. 100 Mikhaevs attesting to the need for water purification before entering into temple rites have been found by Hebrew University's Benjamin Zar around the wall adjacent to Herod's temple. The calves resembling large bathtubs or small garden ponds have been found in Jericho and elsewhere in Israel. The ancient Jews tried to make sure their family's macabre was connected to a source of living water, like a spring or well, but that was not always possible. Tap water could not be used as a primary source of water for the macabre, but the rabbis decided you could use top off. You, excuse me, you could top off the macabre to a suitable level with a little tap water. The rules of thumb was that the macabre should be big enough to hold. 40 seas of water. When asked how much volume the a sea was, the rabbi said it was enough to fit 144 eggs. Now, I just want to get to this uh, last point right here, read it, and then I'll move on. It has been a temptation in all religions to replace the ritual for the reality it was meant to reflect. One rabbi has suggested that the mekev contained enough water to cover the body of an average sized man that there have always been sensible people. So again, the ritual of being dipped in the water is not what's going to save you. It was just a representation of what was happening in the spirit. So for you to say that you getting physically dipped in the water is what's going to save you, brother, you're confused and you don't. I really had a question if you have an understanding of of of, of, of the scriptures and if um, the Most High has truly redeemed and understand your stood and uh, basically redeemed your mind if you've come to a true understanding of the word. Because again, when you come to a true understanding of the word. You're already going to understand how you're baptized because you're going to realize, wow, how much I've changed from the person I was to, before to now. How much the Most High have cleansed me of a lot of the wicked th deeds that I used to do before. But yeah, I just wanted to um, go on this little uh, article about uh, um, baptism. This is on Wikipedia. The practice of baptism emerged from Jewish ritualistic practices during the second temple period, out of which figures such as Don the Baptist emerged, meaning even before uh, the time of the Christ and John the Baptist, people were still, quote unquote, getting baptized. It was a practice that was happening during that time period that emerged during that time period. But continue on. For example, various texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Corpus at Come from describe ritual practices involve washing, bathing, sprinkling, and immersing. And before I go on, uh, during that uh, time period, uh, the reason why people got baptized, it was, again, it was a way to show that they had repented and changed their mind. It wasn't something that John the Baptist invented himself. He just used it as a way to, you know, to show everybody ar uh, around him who, who saw the people getting baptized that they had renewed their spirit. Like even, for example, uh, during this time period, there were many people who were, who were not of the Jewish religion during that time period, if they ever converted to the Jewish religion, not 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 of the teaching of Christ, but the quote unquote teachings of the the Pharisees, the Jewish religion at that time, at that time, they were baptized themselves to show that they would change as well. Again, water baptism was just a ritualistic practice, just to show a changing of the mind, but it's not something that <laughs> that's going to save you.
<laughs> Continuing on. One example of such a text is known as a DSS, known as the rule of community, which says, and by the compliance of his soul with all the laws of the most high, his flesh is cleansed by being sprinkled with cleansing waters and being made holy with the waters of repentance. The Medeans, who are followers of John the Baptist, practice frequent full immersion baptism as a ritual of purification. They are thought to have left the Jordan Valley in the first century CE. John the Baptist, who was considered a forerunner to Christianity, used baptism as a central sacrament of his messianic movement. The apostle Paul distinguished between the baptism of John, which is baptism of repentance, and the baptism in the name of uh, Christ. And it is questionable whether a uh, Christian baptism is, excuse me, was in some way linked with that of John. However, according to Mark 1 and 8, John seems to connect his water baptism as a type of the true ultimate baptism of Christ, which is by the Spirit. Christians consider Christ who have instituted the sacrament of baptism. So again, John's water baptism was a sign of repentance, but Christ's baptism was representing something spiritual, something deeper, something that even in this time period, we, we don't fully experience. Because again, like I read in Mark, the 16th chapter, we weren't given the same gifts of, of those brothers who existed during that time period. Continuing on, though some form of, of immersion was most like was likely the most common method of baptism in the early church. Many of the writings from the ancient church appear to view this mode of baptism as inconsequential. In the Didasi, which is eighty sixty to one fifty, allowed for effusion practices in situation where immersion was not practical. Likewise, Tertullian eighty one ninety six to two twelve allowed for varying approaches to baptism, even if those practices did not conform to biblical or traditional mandates. Finally, Cyprian, 8256, explicitly stated that the amount of water was inconsequential and defended immersion, infusion, and aspersion practices. As a result, there was no uniform or consistent mode of baptism in the ancient church prior to the 4th century. And again, the 1st century, for those brothers who don't know, that's really what, when, when there was a rise to the quote-unquote Catholic church during the uh, Council of uh, Nicaea. But again, I believe that was uh, 312 uh, AD under Constantine. Again, by the 3rd and 4th centuries, baptism involved cathedral instruction as well as Christian um, exorcism, laying on hands, and recitation of a creed. Again, 3rd and 4th century, that's when you had the rise of the Catholic Church, and that's when a lot of the uh, quote-unquote practices were institutionalized. Okay, so again, this is uh, from the two Babylons. This just has to do with uh, baptism. It is well known that regeneration by baptism is a fundamental article of Rome, yea, that it stands at the very threshold of the Roman system. So important, according to Rome, is baptism for this purpose, that on the one hand, it is pronounced an absolute necessity for salvation, insomuch that infants dying without it cannot be admitted to glory. And on the other hand, its virtues are so great that it is declared in all case infallibly to regenerate us by a new spiritual birth, making us children of the Most High. It is pronounced to be the first door by which we enter into the fold of Yahweh Shai the Mashiach, the first means by which we receive the grace and reconciliation with the Most High. Therefore, the merits of his death are by baptism applied to our souls in so superabundant a manner a full, as fully to satisfy divine justice for all demands against us, whether for original or actual sin. So again, the concept of quote unquote water baptism being absolutely necessary to be saved comes from the Roman Catholic Church. That's it was never established in the Bible. Again, it was something spiritual. It was the washing of the word. It was the renewing of your mind. And of course, people got water baptized, but that was a ritual to symbolize what was happening in their spirit. And of course, the main importance of spiritual baptism that we don't experience today is that baptism of the Holy Ghost, meaning they have the ability to speak tongues, to uh, heal the sick, raise the dead, basically to do supernatural signs that we don't have today. That was the true that was the true baptism that again we don't have access to death. Continuing on, Bishop Hay, sincere Christian, there are two exceptions to the statement. The case of an infidel converted in a heathen land where it is impossible to get baptism, and the case of a martyr baptized, it is called in his own blood. But in all other cases, whether of young or old, the necessity the necessity is absolute. Meaning, if a person's in a land where they can't get baptized and if they're a martyr, that's that's an exception, at least according to the quote-unquote Catholic Church. Continuing on, 
Now, in both respects, this doctrine is absolutely anti-scriptural. In both, it is purely pagan. It is anti-scriptural. For the Lord, Yahweh Shai the Mashiach, has expressly declared that infants, without the slightest respect to baptism or any external ordinance whatsoever, are capable of admission into all the glory of the heavenly world. And then he says, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. John the Baptist, while yet in his mother's womb, was so filled with joy at the advent of the Savior that as soon as Mary's salvation sounded in the ears of his own mother, the unborn babe leapt in the womb for joy. But again, in that, in that case, that's because of John. Even John for the womb had the spirit of the Most High as well, so he was special. We can't use that case for every child. But when it comes to children inheriting the kingdom of heaven, again, in the scriptures, to let us know that the unbelieving wife, excuse me, the believing husband saves the unbelieving wife and vice versa. And that also applies to the children. If you have children that quote unquote don't believe, <laughs> I mean, it really doesn't matter because they're a child, but you as a man believe and they're under you. They're saved through you because you are the head over them. So because you lead them, they're going to be saved through you. But continuing on. Had that child died at birth, what could have excluded it from the inheritance of the saints in life, for which is so certainly made met? Yet the Roman Catholic Bishop Hay, in the defiance of a very principle of God's word, does not hesitate to pen the following question. What becomes of young children who die without baptism? Answer, if a young child were put to death for the sake of Christ, this would be to it the baptism of blood and carry it to heaven. But except in this case, as such infants are incapable of having the desire of baptism. Uh, okay, as such infants are incapable of having the desire of baptism with the other necessary dispositions. If they are not actually baptized with water, they cannot go to heaven. As this doctrine never came from the Bible, whence came it? It came from heathenism. The classic reader cannot fail to remember where and in what melancholy plight. Aenus, when he visited the infernal regions, found the souls of the happy infants who had died before receiving, receiving, so to speak, the rites of the church. Read this. Before the gates, the cries of babies newborn, whom fate had from their tender mother's torn assault his ears. Now, again, when it comes to the esoteric aspect of, quote unquote, baptism from the pagan essence, water uh, references the, uh, the mother goddess. Um, for you, those who brothers who watched my video when it came to uh, the uh, quote unquote chariots, I explained to you there that uh, that downward pointing triangle represents the the mother goddess, the womb, as well as water. And uh, of course, we know the mother goddess represents the Holy Spirit. So people in this time who are being quote unquote baptized and they think the spirit's being put upon them is really the spirit of the mother goddess that they're uh, worshiping. Because again, water baptism was not meant to save. People, it was just a representation of what was going on internally. So to think you're being saved by water baptism, you're sadly mistaken. If, if you're really being quote unquote saved by the mother goddess, if you believe that aspect, okay, let me just read this paragraph. So much for the lack of baptism, then, as it is positive effic efficacy when obtained, the papal doctrine is equally anti scriptural. They are professed Protestants who hold the doctrine of baptismal regeneration, but the word of the Most High knows nothing of it. Of it. When it's talking about Protestants, that's a, people who aren't Catholic, meaning Baptists, Presbyterians, essentially the Christian church. The scriptural account of baptism is not that it communicates a new birth, but that it is the appointed means of signifying and sealing that new birth where it already exists. In this respect, baptism stands on the very same ground as circumcision. Not what says God's word of the efficacy of circumcision. This it says, speaking of Abraham, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised. Circumcision was not intended to make Abraham righteous. He was righteous already before he was circumcised, but it was intended to declare him righteous and to give him the more abundant evidence of, in his own consciousness of him being so. Had Abraham not been righteous before his circumcision, his circumcision could not have been a seal. Could not have given him confirmation to that which did not exist. So with baptism, it is a seal of righteousness of the faith, which the man has before he is baptized. For it is said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Where faith exists, if it be genuine, it is the evidence of a new heart, of a regenerated nature. It is only on the profession of that faith and regeneration in the case of an adult that he is admitted to baptism. Meaning what? The author is essentially saying that... <laughs> The true baptism is spiritual. It's a renewing of your mind. You understanding 
who you are and, uh, you know, coming back to your power, following the law, statutes and commandments to the best of your ability. Once your mind is renewed, that's truly what saved you. You getting dipped in water is not a, a, a prerequisite of salvation. It's only an outward showing or if you want to say an outward confirmation of what's already going on internally. So to, to, to say that um, you being physically baptized of water is a requirement to salvation, brother, you're, you, you're completely not understanding <laughs> the scriptures and the whole point of uh, you being saved. Because at that point, if, if water baptism is a prerequisite of you being saved, then what's the point of actually reading the word and getting that understanding to cleanse you? If, quote unquote, you being baptized in water is what's going to cleanse you. But continuing on, let me see. Even in the case of infant, infants who can make no profession of faith or holiness, the administration of baptism is not for the purpose of regenerating them or making them holy, but of declaring them holy in the sense of being fit for being consecrated even in infancy to the service of Christ, just as the whole nation of Israel, in consequence of their relation to Abraham, according to the flesh, were holy unto the Lord. Meaning, in the ancient world where infants were, quote unquote, baptized or they sprinkled water, it wasn't to say, oh, they're baptized, they're saved. It was basically a way of consecrating them and uh, dedicating that child to the most high and, you know, into the service of the Lord. But that can only truly come if they're raised properly. If they're not raised properly, them, them being sprinkled with water, that shit is not going to matter. Continuing on, if they were not in that figurative steps holy, they would not be fit subjects for baptism, which is the seal of a holy state. But the Bible pronounces them in consequence of their descent from believing parents to be holy and that even where only one of the parents is a believer. The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. And that's 1 Corinthians 7 and 14. It is in consequence of and solemnly to declare that holiness with all responsibility attaching to it that they are baptized. That holiness, however, is very different from the holiness of the new nature. And, all the very, and although the very fact of baptism, if scripturally viewed and duly approved, is in the hand of the good spirit of the Most High, an important means of making that holiness a glorious reality in the highest sense of the term, yet it is not in all cases necessarily secure spiritual regeneration. The Most High may or may not, as he see fits, give the new heart before or at or after baptism. Meaning what? For our people who are getting, who are getting dipped in water, you, you might have not have been truly baptized in the Spirit, because again, it's the Spirit that's that spiritual regeneration, that spiritual understanding of the scriptures that truly changes you. For some people, that happens before you get dipped in the water. For some people, it happens after. But you getting dipped in the water is not what's going to save you. It's your spirit being changed what's going to save you. But continuing on. But manifest, it is that thousands who have been duly baptized are still unregenerated and are still in precisely the same position as Simon Magus, who after being canonically baptized by Philip, was declared to be in the gall of bitterness and a bond of iniquity. So again, this is a brother in the scriptures who was literally baptized by Philip, but he was still wicked, showing that him being put in the water is not what saved him. But let me continue. The doctrine of Rome, however, is that all who are canonically baptized, however ignorant, however immoral, if they only give implicit faith to the church and surrender their, their conscience to the priest, are as much regenerated as ever they can be, and that children coming from the waters of baptism are entirely purged, from the stain of original sin. Hence, they're saying if you don't get physically water baptized, you can't be saved because that water is going to purify you. And again, I don't, I don't care what type of loop runs you try to go. For you to say you need to be physically dipped in water to be saved, that's you acknowledging that you being dipped in that physical water is, is purifying you. And again, that's not scriptural. You And you can't get around that too because if you being dipped in the water is not what's physically saving you, then what's the point? Let me read this point right here. This doctrine of baptismal regeneration also is essentially Babylonian. Some may perhaps stumble at the idea of regeneration at all having been known in the pagan world, but if they only go to India, they will find it at this day. The bigoted Hindus who have never opened their ears to Christian instruction are familiar with the term and the idea as ourselves. The Brahmins make it in their distinguishing boast that they are twice born men and that as such they are sure of eternal happiness. Now, the same was the case in Babylon, and there the new birth was conferred by baptism. In the Chaldean mysteries, before any instruction could be received, it was required first of all that the person to be initiated submit to baptism in token of blind and implicit obedience. 
So again, you're telling a person that, oh, you're not going to have a true understanding of the truth unless you get baptized in water. That, that's a that's a Babylonian pagan aspect because again, you getting dipped in the water is not what's going to give you the true understanding of the truth. You get your true understanding of the truth from reading the scriptures and the, the Most High blesses you. He'll give you the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to see the truth. Yeah, but I just want to touch this aspect right here that goes into uh, how the people in, in Mexico uh, baptize people because literally that concept of a baptism is pagan and uh, regions all across the world did it from uh, our people in the New World, Egypt, Babylon, the, the, the Hindus, all over. And they all did it in, in, in reverence of the quote unquote mother goddess because the mother goddess is the Holy Spirit. Well, let me just read this excerpt. The ceremony of Mexican baptism, which was beheld with astonishment by the Spanish Roman Catholic missionaries, is thus strikingly described in Pesco's Conquest of Mexico, meaning when the Romans uh, went to, uh, to um, Mexico, they were shocked to see that, what the hell? These people are practicing baptism, but they're not Christians. Where did they get this concept from? But let me read. When everything necessary for the baptism had been made ready, all the relations of the child were assembled, and the midwife who was a person that performed the rite of baptism was summoned. At early dawn, they met together in the courtyard of the house. When the sun had risen, the midwife, taking the child in her arms, called for a little earthen vessel of water, while those about her placed the ornaments, which had been prepared for baptism in the midst of the court, to perform the rite of baptism. She placed herself with her face toward the west. Excuse me. She placed herself with her face toward the west and immediately began to go through certain ceremonies. After this, she sprinkled water on the head of the infant, saying, Oh, my child. Take and receive the water of the Lord of the world, which is our life, which is given for the increasing and renewing of our body. It is to wash and to purify. I pray that these heavenly drops may enter into your body and dwell there, that they may destroy and remove from you all the evil and sin which was given you before the beginning of the world, since all of us are under its power. She then washed the body of the child with water and spoke in this manner. Whensoever thou comest, thou art, and thou, excuse me, whensoever thou comest, thou that art hurtful to this child, leave him and depart from him. For he now liveth anew and is born anew. Now he is purified and cleansed afresh. And our mother, I can't even say that term, but that's the Mexican mother goddess or the goddess of the water, bringeth him into the world. Having thus prayed, the midwife took the child in both hands and lifted him towards heaven and said, O Lord, thou seest here thy creature whom thou hast sent into the world, this place of sorrow, suffering, and penitence. Grant him, O Lord, thy gifts and inspiration for thou art the great God and with thee, is a great goddess. <laughs> so for any of you brothers who ever been to church and been baptized, they don't say it just like this, but honestly, they'd be saying a lot of the similar shit, man. There's nothing new under the sun. It's the same spirit. So for you brothers who think water baptism is, is going to save you, you're not doing it in veneration of the Most High. You're doing it in veneration of the Mother Goddess. Because those who believe in the Mother Goddess believe that water baptism was what's going to save them. Those of us who understand the scriptures understand that it's not the water that cleanses us. It's the word. Man. I, don't, I, don't, I don't get why it's so hard for brothers to understand. Okay, now I just want to touch on another aspect of baptism. How um, we understand in a, in the truth in the truth sense that water that baptism during Christ time was a, a representation of the Holy Spirit. Now to the pagans, though, the Holy Spirit is the Mother Goddess. That's why uh, water baptism is important in this time period. The water represents the spirit of the mother goddess, but let's read this excerpt. While thus far we have seen how the papal baptism is just a reproduction of the Chaldean, there is still one other point to be noticed, which makes the demonstration complete. That point is contained in the following tremendous curse fulminated against a man who committed the unpardonable offense of leaving the Church of Rome and published grave and weighty reasons for doing so. May the Father who creates man curse him. May the Son who suffered for us curse him. May the Holy Ghost who suffered for us in baptism curse him. I, I do not stop to show how absolutely and utterly opposed such a curse as this is to the whole spirit of the gospel. But what I call the reader's attention is to the astounding statement that the Holy Ghost suffered for us in baptism. Where in the whole compass of scripture could warrant be found for such an assertion as this or anything could even suggest? Again, when they're talking about the Holy Ghost suffering in baptism, that's because for the pagans, the Holy Ghost is the mother goddess the god Juno, or Astarte, Ananya, whatever, whatever whatever, you want to call her, because it's all the same uh, entity, which is Semiramis. Continuing on, 
would let the reader revert to the Babylonian account of the personality of the Holy Ghost, and the amount of blasphemy contained in this language will be apparent. According to the Chaldean doctrine, Samaramis, the wife of Ninus, or Nimrod, when exalted to divinity under the name of Queen of Heaven, came, as we have seen, to be worshipped as Juno, the dove, in other words, the Holy Spirit incarnate. Now when her husband, for his blasphemous rebellion against the majesty of heaven, was cut off for a season, it was a time of tribulation also for her. The fragments of ancient history that have come down to us give an account of her trepidation of flight to save herself from her adverse adversaries. In the fables of the mythology, this flight was mystically represented in accordance with what was attributed to her husband. The bards of Greece represented Bacchus, when overcome by his enemies, has taken refuge in the depth of the ocean. Thus Homer, in a mad mood while Bacchus blindly raged, Lycurgus drove his trembling bands confused o'er the vast plains of Nusa. They, in the haste, threw down their sacred implements and fled in fearful dispensation. Bacchus saw route up route and lost in wild dismay, plunged in the deep. Here Thethys in arms received him, shuddering at the dire event. In Egypt, as we have seen, Osiris, as de identified with Noah, was represented when overcome by his grand enemy Typhon. And the reason why Osiris represents Noah is because the, the god Osiris, and for those who don't know, is the god of the dead, the god of the underworld. And the god Osiris is also synonymous with the god of Janus. Now, Janus, for those of you brothers who don't know, is a, the god who has the two faces, one young man, one old man. The old man represented Noah in the old world, the new, young man represents Noah in the new world. And also Janus was, um, I believe he was known as the god of water as well, the god of the deep, representing um, a Noah as well. But continuing on, the poets represented, uh, excuse me, let me read that again. In Egypt, as we have seen, Osiris, as identified with Noah, was represented when overcome by his grand enemy Typhon, or the evil one, as passing through the waters. The poets represented Semiramis as sharing his distress, in his distress, and likewise seeking safety in the same way. We have we have seen already that under the name of Starte, she was said to have come forth from a wondrous egg that was found floating on the water of the Euphrates. By the way, for those of you brothers who don't know, that's where we get the concept of Easter for the egg represents the, the mother goddess. Now, Menelianus tells us in the astronomical poetics, what induced her to take refuge in these waters? Venus plunged into the Babylonian water, says she, he, to shun the fury of the snake-footed Typhon. When Venus, Uriana, or Dione, the heavenly dove, plunged into the deep, distressed into these waters of Babylon, be to observe what, according to the Chaldean doctrine, this amounted to. It was neither more or, no, or less, excuse me, it was neither more nor less than saying that the Holy Ghost incarnate in deep tribulation entered these waters, and that on purpose that these waters might be fit not only by the temporal abode of the Messiah in the midst of them, but that by the Spirit's efficacy thus imparted to them for giving new life and regeneration by baptism to the worshipers of the Chaldean Madonna. So again, for brothers who truly believe that water baptism renews them and that's a part of that salvation, that's not scriptural. It comes from the ancient Babylonian practices because they worship and venerate the mother goddess and understood that the spirit of the mother goddess represented water. So when they were submerged in the water, they're being renewed by the energies of the mother goddess, essentially. Let me continue. We have evidence that the purifying virtues of water, which in pagan esteem had such efficacy in cleansing from guilt and regenerating the soul, was derived in part from the passing of the meditorial god, the sun god, and god of fire through these waters during his humiliation and surgeon in the midst of them, and that the papacy at this day retains the very custom which has sprung up from that persuasion. So far as heathenism is concerned, the following extracts from Potter and Athenius speaks distinctly enough. Every person, says the former, who came to the solemn sacrifices was purified by water, to which end at the entrance of the temples, there was commonly placed a vessel full of holy water. <laughs> and honestly, I think I've read enough when it comes to the pagan understanding of baptism. For those of you brothers who don't get it, you just never meant to get it. And I actually want to touch on the concept of first circumcision. circumcision. It was alluded a little bit earlier in the two Babylons, but the reason why it's important is because, again, even during the time period of the apostles, for example, the Pharisees were very dogmatic about uh, circumcision. They wanted to make sure that uh, they wanted every Israelite 
or any uh, Gentile as well, they were essentially telling people that in order to be saved, you had to be physically circumcised. And now Paul and the apostles were letting the people know that's not true. It's, a, it's the change of your heart and your spirit that matters, not you getting physically circumcised. The reason why I believe this is important is because <laughs> you can rely this, you can tie this in the baptism. Because circumcision is something that's outwardly done as well as baptism. But the only difference is circumcision was actually written in the laws of old. <laughs> baptism is not. <laughs> but let me let me read. Behold, thou art called a Jew. And restest in the law, and makest thy boast of the Most High, and knowest His will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore, which teaches another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? So basically, Paul was letting the quote unquote Jews know. <laughs> You're real boastful about, quote unquote, being circumcised and all. Oh, I keep this law. I do this and I do that. And how you, you think you're, you're teachers of men and how you can instruct people, how you can, quote unquote, you're a shepherd and lead the street sheep. But he was letting them know, <laughs> do you truly understand the scriptures? <laughs> Before you can go out teaching people, you actually really got to teach yourself. You want to, you know, be dogmatic about the law and teach others about the truth. But you're not even keeping it to the best of your ability yet. You don't fully have an understanding of the truth. So before you want to go out and uh, proclaim the people that this is what you have to do to be saved, you got to work on yourself, man. But let me continue. Romans 2 and 22. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that has horrid idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonors the Most High. For the name of the Most High is blasphemed among the Gentiles, though through you, as it is written, her circumcision verily profited. If thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision, and shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who be be who by the letter of circumcision does transgress the law. So again, Paul is letting people know if you're quote unquote circumcised and you're breaking the law, then you might as well be uncircumcised. But if you're an uncircumcised person and you're keeping the law, then you're then you're truly circumcised because your circumcision has to do with something spiritual, not physical. Now, I just want to get this precept to get let brothers to understand that the quote unquote circumcision being spiritual, that was like that from the very beginning. But again, our people have always been hard headed and stubborn. They they don't understand certain concepts in the spirit. But let's go back to Deuteronomy 10. This so this is Deuteronomy 10. I'll start at verse 13. Or at verse 12. And now, Israel, what did the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I have commanded thee this day for thy good. Again, the law, statutes, and commandment are for our good. And you have to understand that to not be confounded by things in the Bible. Because if you're just a zealot and you're like, oh, I have to do this to be quote unquote righteous. <laughs> You, you basically are making yourself a character. You're not even a real person because a, a real man understands what he's doing. It's not about I'm doing this and I'm righteous. I'm, I'm a righteous uh, nigga. I'm doing all this for the most high. It's like, no, I'm doing this because the most high commanded it to me to do it. And it's for my benefit. And I understand why the most high com commanded because I actually listened to what my father told me. I listened to the instructions that my father told me. Mom, my father told me don't to do this because this was going to happen. Happen to you. I was able to consider that. And know and understand that not, oh, I just I just can't do it to do this because my dad said so. But uh, let me continue on. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God. The earth also with all that therein is only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them. And he chose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is this day. Now, this is a key, key verse. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff necked again. That's truly what the Most High wants from us to to basically have a, a, a honest heart and spirit to be willing to change. Again, even the prophet Samuel, for those of you brothers remember, when he spoke to Saul after Saul transgressed the eyes, the, the word of the Lord, he said that the, the Most High isn't appeased by sacrifice and offering, but by obedience. Obedience is what the Most High truly expects from us, not sacrifice. 
Oh, here's the precept that I wanted to get that the um what Samuel, and this is Samuel speaking to uh Paul. And Samuel said, or excuse me, not Paul, Saul. And Samuel said, Had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So again, it's not about outward showing and quote unquote wearing fringes and garments and going out and preaching and teaching and screaming and quote unquote rebuking people and doing all that shit. No, it's about obeying the most high and keeping the law, statutes and commandments to the best of your ability. It's not something that's for show. It's not something you can do outwardly. It's something that comes internally. And that's the whole point of being in this truth. That's the whole point of understanding the scriptures. It's something that's supposed to be happening in your mind, in your spirit, not something that you do for show. Honestly, that's a big fucking joke to me when I see people who, who want to do things for show, but don't truly understand the word in the scriptures, man. Ridiculous, man. Fucking stupid. Okay, now I wanted to go to Acts, the 15th chapter, verse 5. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye you know how that a good while ago the Most High made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe, and the Most High, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Again, their hearts were purified by faith, not by fucking water, man. I don't know how. <laughs> it's not that difficult. But uh, the next verse. Now, therefore... Why tempt you the most high to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Meaning what? Keeping the law and understanding the law is important, but you can't be a, a, a zealot and want to strictly follow the law to, do, <laughs> to every T and be like, oh, brother, you're not wearing fringes, man. Uh, you're not doing this, man. Uh, you're not going to the highways and byways, man. Like me, I'm I'm a more righteous brother than you. Blah 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 blah. Because <laughs> that's not what this uh, what this truth is about. It's it's something that's internal. And at the end of the day, if you try to just be uh, uh, basically follow the law to the T to the letter, you're going to end up destroying yourself, just like our forefathers did. That's the whole point of having grace. Like you know, you try to keep the law to the best of your ability, but when you slip off, you acknowledge that slip up. And you move forward and you try to, you know, implement steps in your life so you don't repeat the same mistake, man. That's that's all it's, it's about. OK, so this is Galatians chapter six. I just want to start at verse 11. You see how large a letter that I have written unto you with my own hand, as many as desire to make a fair shoe in the flesh. They constrain you to be circumcised only lest th they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. So basically what Paul is letting these people know is that <laughs> the reason why they're trying to uh, stress you to be circumcised is not truly for you to repent. It's a way to glorify yourself in the flesh. Be like, look at me. I'm so righteous. I've circumcised myself and you can apply to the baptism. Look at me. I'm righteous. I, I have a, a high, others, far higher understanding than all the other brothers. If you were only to get baptized like me, you would see things how I see it. It's all about glorifying yourself in the flesh. But continuing on, God forbid that I should glorify, save in the cross of our Lord, Yahweh Shai the Mashiach, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ now their circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Again, I'll read that again. For in Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And again, you can apply this to quote unquote water baptism as well. It's not about you getting dipped in water or not getting dipped in water. It's about you becoming a new person, renewing your mind and your spirit. <laughs> but this is something I've just noticed from my experience for brothers who are, are so focused on quote unquote being water baptized. It's not really about you being saved and renewed. It's really about you being able to boast and feel like you're more exalted than another brother to uh, quote unquote feel like you have uh, some type of a uh, deeper understanding of the scriptures than everybody else to make yourself feel more special. Like I write in verse 13, you're just glorifying in your flesh. And that's something I've noticed with uh, brothers with that mindset. But before I close today, I do want to go on uh, one quick aside just to stress on brothers, man. 
you know, it's important to keep the law, statutes, and the commandments to the best of your abilities. But man, don't try to act like you're an ancient Israelite, man. <laughs> don't try to act like you're one of the forefathers, man. Be yourself, man. Because at the end of the day, I say it like this. There's a reason we're in a time period of grace. Because the Most High understands that we've been cut off from a true understanding of the scriptures for so long. We've been darkness for so long that <laughs> we're basically fools in this is this time period. For those of you brothers who haven't read in 2nd Ezra, it's the fifth chapter, starting, I believe, in verse 53. Um, the angel of the Lord lets uh, Ezra know that essentially, as time progresses, people become less than the people before, meaning our ancient forefathers. Not only did they have a better spirit, they had a better spiritual understanding than us. They were larger than us. They were stronger than us. They were naturally more intelligent than us. They're more, they more eloquent than us. I mean, just read the scriptures and, and see some of the type of prayers that Solomon made, the Psalms of David, the great things that our forefathers did. We just we don't have the ability to do those things. It's not natural for us because we're lesser of stature, strength, wisdom, understanding than our forefathers. So to try to act like we're one of them is really foolish. But that's where the grace and mercy of the most high comes, man. Because I'll put it like this. If we were to compare us to our forefathers, like, you know, the most high is our father and our forefathers are our older brothers. <laughs> We'd be the, the little retarded brother of the family, man. Like, <laughs> that's why the Most High has grace and mercy on us. You know, when uh, you're dealing with children, you you hold uh, the children who are older and who are more intelligent to, than a higher standard than one who's younger and, and half retarded. Like, <laughs> if you have a kid who's half retarded and he breaks shit, you might be upset on him. But, like, you know, you're going to have mercy on him and forgive him because, like, I mean, he can't help that shit. He half retarded. <laughs> and that's what it means to be in this truth in, in this time period that we're in, because, you know, we've basically been, uh, grown in a, 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 a reprobate, wicked Babylonian society. <laughs> our understanding is just not going to be there. Our spirit is not going to be like our forefathers, man. So to try to act like, quote unquote, our forefathers and try to, quote unquote, be uh, uh, zealous for the most high. You only look like a fool. And I just relate this to one story. I remember my mom. Uh, she used to work. Uh, basically, she used to take care of a special needs kid. I think the kid was uh, Michael. And, you know, she had to feed him, bathe him, wipe him down, shit like that. But imagine one time if my mom was feeding him and that kid tried to grab this food and feed himself. You know what happened? He spilled the food all over himself and my mom. And that's what happens to a lot of you brothers <laughs> who try to act like something you're not. <laughs> you end up making a fool out of yourself, man. But with that, I, I just want to make uh, close the video. Y'all brothers have a great rest of your day.